So welcome to those who are here in the room. Welcome to those who are connected online to the inaugural lecture of FIBO, the ERC project, Federalism and Border Management in Greek Antiquity. The host institution of this project is the University of Trento, especially the Department of Humanities. So it is my pleasure to give the floor to the Vice Rector for Research and ERC grantee, Professor Francesca De Michelis. Thank you. Thank you, Elena, for uh, for introduction. Thank you, everyone, to be here. Uh, I'm very I'm very glad to open uh, uh, this uh, this day and this uh, initial event for uh, uh, two series of seminars. So we all know that uh, ERC program is highly selective. Um, it's uh, merely based on the uh, uniqueness and the um, value of the research that is proposed. And so every time the University of Trento has uh, an ERC awarded to someone uh, uh, who is uh, working here or who decides to join here is obviously a great satisfaction. And uh, I think it's really great that I, our university does have a nice history of uh, ERC awardees. Uh, 33 ERC award, uh, awards have been uh, uh, given to professors at the University of Trento. And I think another seven uh, ERC proof of concept, but uh, most of them uh, have actually been awarded uh, in uh, domains that are different than uh, uh, social sciences and humanities. So this is not the first one, but it's obviously uh, one peculiarity of a grant uh, that was awarded uh, to Professor Elena Franchi. So that makes us uh, very proud, obviously, and uh, uh, we totally recognize uh, how difficult it is uh, to um, get one of those achievements uh, in Italy and actually across Europe. When, when I spoke with Pro Professor Franchi to congratulate her uh, when, uh, when she was awarded uh, the ERC, I remember that I was uh, impressed and actually uh, really curious about the topic uh, of, of the project. Uh, because uh, um, it's so um, relevant uh, to today uh, history. So history in general, I would say it uh, gives us a chance to uh, pause and think about what happened in the past. History is a guide for uh, uh, what uh, is going to happen in our future. And especially the topic of this grant uh, is so relevant to what's happening uh, uh, in our society and learning about uh, um, the strategies that have been taken in the past uh, on borders and uh, how to exploit them actually to uh, enhance connectivity among uh, uh, different countries is something uh, that uh, is inspirational for, for today and for the future. So I'm really happy. I'm, I'm proud uh, of uh, Professor Franchi. I'm glad to be here um, today with you and also to listen to the introductory talk uh, um, um, by um, the guest uh, who is uh, Professor Hans Beck. So thank you, Elena, and congratulations again. Grazie, Francesca. Thank you very much. Thank you. So as I say, the host institution is the University of Trento and especially the Department of Humanities. So I'm delighted to give the floor to the director of the Department of Humanities, Marco Gozzi. Thank you, Elena. I'm very pleased to bring my welcome uh, and the welcome of the entire Department of Humanities of University of Trento for this uh, first public event of a prestigious project by Elena Franchi, the result of a grant from the European Research Council. Uh, the Department of Humanities shows an ex excellent quality of research as the Proto-Rector for Research, Francesca de Michelis, has just recalled, uh, quality testified by the excellent uh, result of the periodic na national evaluation of uh, the quality of research. 
and uh, the conferral for the second time of ministerial founding linked to the project of the departments of excellence. The department attracts uh, young talents throughout the participation in competition calls, such as uh, the Marie Curie project, the Jean Monnet founding, and last year, uh, also two ERC, ERCs, an absolutely rare event in the humanities department. Congratulations to Elena Franchi and all the people who put themselves in the game to find funding for their research. It is nice to be here to inaugurate a research project on a topic of absolute relevance, that of coexistence between peoples separated by a border. A warm thanks goes to Professor Hans Beck of the uh, University of Munster, uh, who has made himself available to inaugurate the two seminars, uh, seminar cycles of the project, FABO, Federalism and Border Management in Greek Antiquity. And that uh, will help us today to reflect on interpolis cooperation and competition, the case of Southern Boyotia. Thanks also to all, all the people who are here and who are connected online and who wanted to, particip to participate in this lucky event and good Lectio Inauguralis. Thank you, Marco Gozzi. Federation for Peace in Ancient Greece is the title of a well-known article by Jacob Larsen, written in 1944. As the world was being ravaged by wars, Larsen wondered about the potential of federalism as a tool for conflict resolution. Did federalization processes promote peace? The Federation for Peace dilemma dominated studies in the 19th century through post-World War II, the Cold War, the nascent European Union, and moreover, it has been the hope to which many have clung in the face of crumbling nation, the dramas of ethnic conflicts and the challenge of religious conflicts. Did federalism promote peace? Something had to exist to keep nations united in peace, that something seemed to be federalism. Well, our project starts from the assumption that the question, that this question, which continues to be asked by scholars, no longer makes sense. Despite romantic projection, federalization process do not guarantee alone peaceful coexistence. If anything, federalism is an accelerator. With regard to ancient Greece, uh, the question we should be asking, I think, uh, focuses on borders. How did the Greek federal states deal with the problem of internal, that is intrafederal or external borders? Borders were not lines on the ground separating different worlds. They were continuously crossed by people, objects, ideas, giving rise to economic, religious, cultural, ethnic networks, which ignored the political frontier. Even communities of a destiny with a strong sense of belonging, which were of crucial importance for the stability of a federal state. This inaugural event opens a pathway that will include several research and dissemination actions. What we have called webinars, thanks to an idea of Claudio Biagetti, is one of these. Together with numerous speakers, we will try to understand what happens on the borders and whether the key for success of federal states as for example, the Italians or the Achaeans was careful border management. 
The host institution is the University of Trento and in particular the Department of Humanities and the research will be conducted here in Trento by me with my collaborators based on my idea and will be supported by the facility of the LAPSA, the Laboratory for Ancient History, but we will not close ourselves off and indeed we'll be in continuous dialogue with those we have called the Friends of FIBO, informal partners, thank you Claudio, who are connected and I would like to list them. Seminar für Alte Geschichte, Westfälische Wilhelm Universität Münster mit der ganzen Münsteraner Gruppe, wir haben hier Hans Beck und auch Peter Funke online. Area de Historia Antigua, Universidad Autónoma de Madrid, with Jose Pascal and Adolfo Dominguez Monedero. Lehrstuhl für Alte Geschichte, Universität Regensburg, mit Angela Ganter. Institute of Comparative Federalism, Eurac Bolzano, mit Francesco Palermo and Jans Wölk. Institut du Federalism Fribourg. Avec uh, Eva Maria Belsa, but uh, Belsa could not connect because she was busy presenting a master degree, but is represented by Arianna Guidolin. Universität Hamburg, Fachbereich Alte Geschichte mit Kaya Hater Wibupu, and the Center for Spartan and Peloponnesian Studies with Chris Antigallu and Jim Roy and many others. And other contacts are underway with other centers and universities that will lengthen, I hope, this list of uh, friends. And uh, contributors to this think tank will also be the future speakers of the webinars. Uh, that is in alphabetical order. Claudia Antonetti, Ca Foscari, Cinzia Berzot, Cattolica di Milano, Eva Maria Belsa, Fribourg, Corinne Bonnet, Université de Toulouse, Adolfo Dominguez Monedero, Autonoma de Madrid, Leif Donelan, University of Melbourne, Stefano Frullini, Cambridge, Peter Funke, Westfälische Wilhelm Universität Münster, Angela Ganter, Regensburg, Hans Joachim Gerke, Freiburg, mein Postdoc Vater, Maurizio Giangiulio, Università di Trento, il mio maestro, Kaya Harteru Ibupu, Hamburg, Johanna Kralli, Union University, Chiara Lasagni, Università di Torino, Sylvain Le Breton, Toulouse, Laura Loddo, Cattolica, Alex McCauley, Cardiff University, Jeremy McKinnervy, University of Pennsylvania, Francesco Palermo, Università di Verona, and uh, Oirac Bolzano, Jose Pascal, Universidad Autónoma de Madrid, Nicolaus Petrochilos, Federica Pezzoli, Complutense Madrid, Ruben Post, St. Andrews, Maria Pretzler, Svansi, Denis Rousset, Col Pratique des Eaux d'Etudes, Jim Roy, University of Nottingham, Matt Thompson of the same university, Clemence Weber Palais, Toulouse, and Jens Wölk, Università di Trento, and Eurac Pozen. Last but not least, I must thank many people for supporting this project. First of all, Claudio Biagetti and Sebastian Scharf, collaborators on the project, who organized, who also organized a training program for the PhD students and for history tutors. And then, of course, the history tutors, Luca Scotto and Edoardo Carubelli, who are supporting master students to bring them closer to this research. And I also owe Sebastian uh, the commitment to the FIBO at School project, another of the planet dissemination strategies. My special thanks also go to Michele Gasbarri for the logo of the project, Silvia Fedrizzi for the organization, and Anna Pallaver for technical assistance. And I am also grateful to Anna for one more reason, I must say, because she assisted me when uh, I was here alone in a deserted apartment on uh, January the 10th in 2022. She was uh, staying guard uh, outside of uh, her office where I was locked in, uh, having my interview and trying to crack off the 12% and getting in the ERC shortlist. So thank you to Anna. So 
here we are kicking off with an exceptional guest who needs no introduction, of course. So um, I will simply say Hans Beck received his PhD in ancient history from the University of Erlangen-Nuremberg in 1996 with a thesis on Polis und Koinon, Untersuchungen zur Geschichte und Struktur der in Washington, D.C., achieved his habilitation in Köln with a work entitled, this time Roman History, Karriere und Hierarchie, die römische Aristokratie und die Anfänge des Cursus Honorum in der Mittleren Republik. He held a Heisenberg Fellowship awarded by the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft at the Frankfurt University, while in 2005 uh, he was hired to the position of Professor of Ancient Greek History at McGill where he also served as director of classical studies and is member of the Royal Society of Canada. In 2018, he took up the professorship and chair in Greek history at the University of Münster. Hans Beck specializes in the history and culture of the ancient Greek world with a thematic focus on localism and the local police governance and federalism. And uh, he wrote a lot of books and articles, but two books in particular are forthcoming this year, so, that is Localism in Hellenistic Greece. I remember a wonderful conference you organized in Waterloo and uh, the Local Horizon of Ancient Greek Religion with Julia Kind. Today, he will open the webinars for us by discussing borders and federalism in Boyosha, in southern Boyosha. This inaugural lecture initiates two distinct series of webinars, both organized in the framework of the ERC project, and uh, both uh, devoted to the topic of border management in federal Greece, but since uh, intra-federal and extra-federal borders must be necessarily approached from divergent perspective and uh, with divergent questions, uh, each webinar series has a different focus. The first one being articulated around the topic of internal borders, the management of internal borders by federal states, and the second one placing external borders at its center, crossing federal borders, ancient and modern. Hans Beck's lecture initiates both of them since it focuses on a case study involving both the intrafederal and extrafederal borders. So I'll give you the floor and let's go federal. Thank you. Madam Vice Principal, Professor Reza de Michelis, dear Professor Guzzi, dearest Professor Reza Elena Franchi, that is dearest Elena, dear colleagues and students in the room and away on the screen, it's a distinct pleasure to speak to you this evening at the inaugural event of federalism and border management in ancient Greece. Uh, the ERC grant project is designed, as Elena was just saying, designed to explore the mechanics of peaceful conflict resolution in potentially volatile interstate environments. To this end, the core team of researchers turns to federalism as a governing principle that is both straightforward and also complicated. Self-governance, regional independence, and the joining together in endeavors 
that go beyond the limits of the quotidian community. All of these things are obvious, straightforward motivations. Yet the conversations that envelope these motivations are complex, often convoluted, sometimes controversial. Federalism is not static and not set in stone. It's a lived experience. A lift experience, and as such, in this lift experience, it is an ongoing negotiation of all sorts, depending on how developed the underlying state pattern is, the pattern of statehood. We might traverse from more rudimentary conversations about the exercise of foreign policy uh, to more complex issues, legal, economic matters, on to highly detailed areas of the communal governance, for instance, education, healthcare, or the sharing of responsibilities for climate change. There is certainly no better time to speak about these issues and to unpack such a portfolio as there is today. War in Eastern Europe reminds us that in the interstate arena, the federal principle has an opposite, an adversary, as it were, the paths of imperial hegemony with little regard, regard for self-governance, even less for local freedom. Beyond the sheer calamities and indeed crimes inflicted upon the victims, the war is an unwanted reminder of the deep conceptual rifts that divide the conduct of politics in our globalized world. More enchantingly, there is hardly a better place for a research program like that of FIBO to flourish. The Dipartimento di Lettere e Filosofia in Trento is, of course, widely known for its cutting edge research and excellence in teaching. For FIBO's portfolio in particular, it is worthwhile to recall, I believe, that Trentino Alto Adige is referenced far and wide, and indeed admired for its commitment to regional independence and self-governance carried out and implemented before the backdrop of trans-regional togetherness. It's no surprise, I think, that among the list of the growing circles of friends that we have just seen on the screen, we find the Institute for Comparative Federalism in Bolzano, an organization that explores how democratic societies are organized and how decisions are made um, in a locally, globally entangled world. Governance that balances the needs of unity in diversity, pluralism and power control, alien concepts to those who subscribe to imperial dreams of greatness, self-inflation and the perils unleashed by both. I will take you to a world remarkably and comfortably removed from our world here and today. In my presentation, in my lecture, I would like to take you back, let's say two and a half millennia in time to the central Greek universe, to the center of Greece. If there were a map before you of the modern state and you point to the center of this map, you would find the region up on the screen before you labeled in scholarship central Greece, although we realize that such concepts of periphery and center are indeed complicated. Our journey takes us to a region around, there's a pointer, around the stretch of mountains called the Mount Helicon in the west, Mount Kitairon, and Mount Parnas in the very east toward Attica, a mountain chain that roughly separates the lands of central Greece 
from the lands further south into Attica on the one hand and into the Peloponnese on the other. In uh, geographic, topographical terms, these extended mountain ranges are interrupted by certain valleys that run north-south, but by and large, the southern Boeotian plain is clustered around a prominent river, so-called Azopos River. When I speak of the Parasopia in my talk, I will refer to precisely this region around the Asopos River, which is the lands that uh, mark in geographic terms what we call Southern Boeotia. Politically, this is an interesting spot because it unites and in many ways in it converge various spheres of interest. I had already mentioned connections to you between Central Greece, Attica, and the Peloponnese. Um, in this sense, the Central Greek line of interest runs into the direction here uh, from north to south. Pathways from the Peloponnese into Central Greece via Corinth take you into that realm, as well as the Athenian connection into this toward the south uh, eastern quadrant. Note, however, also that in this sense, southern Boeotia is not directly, yet in an impactful manner, surrounded by and connected to at least three Gulf systems. The Corinthian Gulf in the west, the Saronic region, which will figure prominent in my, prominently in my talk today to the south, as much as the Euboean Gulf toward the very eastern end of southern Boeotia. The southern ridge, the Parasopia, in this sense, is the microregion where all of these spheres of interest, where all of these various realms of action come together, work with one another, with, in conversation with one another, and often in conflict with one another. By default, you would imagine that border management border drawing practices and anything that revolves around the idea of movements of people and goods, as was mentioned earlier, is extremely complicated in this convoluted terrain. The political constellation zooming in into the Parasopia is fairly well known to us. The map indicates to you that north of the Azopos, River. The major polis is the city of Thebes, obviously the main stakeholder in Boeotia and wider sections of central Greece. Toward Yasopos, there is no further city between Thebes and Yasopos, with the exception of uh, Skolos, which is very close in the Theban countryside. But once you cross Yasopos, once you get beyond that river, you'll encounter a small number of small settlements. Plataea is the most prominent, well known to many of you, but it is really but one and roughly of the same size as the others, Hysiae, Erythrae, and further south um, across, or at the midst of the mountain ranges of Kitaron, the settlement and fort of Eloi Terai. Note that while the Athenian territory in, classical, in the classical period begins somewhere here between Eloiterai Panakton and Oinoe, note that between Thebes and this southern edge, there is no major big city. There's only smaller settlements, often independent communities with a few hundred inhabitants, um, small scale settlements. No major settlements between Thebes and the Athenian territory. Why is that so? An interesting question that uh, will surface again later. Given the convoluted state of affairs, 
And given the high density of border interactions in the southern Boeotian realm, the region has always attracted the interest of scholars. There is, of course, on the one hand, the rich scholarship on Boeotia and the Boeotian League that in one way or the other would always cover and gravitate back to write about the southern Boeotian realm. It's always part of that type of scholarship. Beyond the Boeotian scholarship in particular, a number of intriguing studies have surfaced starting in 1985 with Josiah Ober's work that zoom in and try to understand border movements, border control practices, if there ever was such a thing in the classical Greek world. How does it work? How is this organized? Uh, Josiah Obas, uh, groundbreaking work on Fortress Attica was only the beginning. Uh, Mark Mann um, in 1993 followed up with the defense of Attica, the Dema Wall and the Boeotian War in the fourth century BCE, which is a book that focuses further to the east on sections of, uh, of one particular sector of those southern uh, Boeotian realms. Graham Oliver, War, Food and the Partics, uh, and, and Partics in Early Hellenistic Athens, covers the terrain once again in a slightly later chronological setting in early Hellenistic times. The most recent approach, and in many ways the most up-to-date, should I say, methodological, methodologically up-to-date approach, comes from a team of researchers that work together under the umbrella of the Mazi Archaeological Project. A fine example of archaeo history the new type of history that people write across Europe and North America that intertwines, intermingles in many ways, the study of literary sources and material evidence, bringing them in fruitful conversation with one another is at the heart and soul of this international research project, the Mazi Archaeological Project. The Mazi team zooms in You've seen these surroundings before now. You're familiar with the surroundings. The Mazi team zooms into the Mazi plain, a small scale plain in the borderlands, as we tend to call them. I'll come back to this. In the borderlands between Boeotia and Attica. But the map already indicates to you that in geographical terms, this Masi plain stretches across the borderline that is drawn so neatly here on our map between Boeotia and Attica. Exploring the material evidence from the Masi plain, uh, plain in, from uh, uh, archaeological surveys and, uh, and further explorations on the ground, the team has concluded, the Masi team has concluded that calling the Masi plain either as part of Attica or as part of Boeotia is a, is, a, is a futile exercise. It seems to be that the Masi plain is somewhat in between. It's a space that is shaped by and best characterized as an in-between area. The fortress of Eloi Terai, which is indicated to you here, is often referenced in scholarship as an Athenian fortress, an Athenian fortress that is built to demarcate the Athenian frontier at a certain moment in time. But time marches on, and Eloi Terai was sometimes in the hands of Boeotia, sometimes in the hands of Attica. Sometimes both quarreled over Eloi Terai, as if there was no other thing on their agenda, whereas the people of Eloi Terai were sandwiched in between. And in similar shifts and movements across the corridor, places like Oinae, 
and Panacton too, this is part of the Masi team's uh, research, changed sites, not for opportunistic reasons, but simply because at any given moment in time, either side of the border would lay claims onto the people of Oinoe, um, the people of Eloiterai and others. What we see is a fluid environment, flexibility over time and across borders that we like to draw as we try to order the evidence and bring order to uh, our material. Now, one perspective to approach this area, and indeed the most common perspective to approach the realm, is that of the Boeotian League. I had already mentioned to you that there is a vast number of studies on the Boeotian League from its earliest beginnings into the Hellenistic and indeed Roman periods. Um, more or less these studies gravitate towards the realm outlined on the map for you and study the various vectors of identity and belonging working in conjunction, in conjunction with the political organization of Boeotia at the time. For our question, border management and <coughs> interpolis engagement in the Southern realm, this type of scholarship is particularly geared toward Thebes as a key point, the cities of Plataea and the city of Tanagra on the northern banks of the Sopos River. The Boeotian League has recently attracted new interest because of exciting new finds from excavations in Thebes. None of those excavations have been systematic. Um, on the contrary, they were rescue uh, uh, excavations made uh, in various places in the city, with the exception of the sanctuary of Heracles, the Heracleion, just outside the city walls in the city of Thebes, um, which has brought to light the shrine of Heracles, this famous new inscription from the city of Thebes that mentions, curiously enough, the office of a boyotark, and that also spells out the city ethnic of a man from the city of Thebes. The need to spell out the city ethnic of a man from Thebes makes it obvious that this document had a broader context to it. Otherwise, the spelling of a, civic, of a city ethnic would be of no particular use. And indeed, this is uh, um, confirmed. This type of interpretation is uh, confirmed when you read on just one more line where the words boyotarchontos are indeed uh, referenced at the bottom of uh, the document. Why is this so exciting? It is exciting because it is the earliest epigraphic reference to the office of a boy otark, and hence the first epigraphic reference to that type of organization that we call the Boeotian League, the type of league that brings order and meaning to the Southern Boeotian realm. Depending on the date of this inscription, which has been suggested between, let's say, the final decades of the sixth century into the mid fifth century. That's a broad span of about 80 years. But depending on the date, an early date would make this an early reference to a league well established, well in function, presumably, possibly as early as the mid sixth century. BCE. Note that the document, whatever it is, I believe it is a contract um, between two individuals who are referenced at the beginning here and whose names are last in for. Note that the regulation is very granular and fine-tuned. It talks about piracy, 
children um, and about a propraxia, a very technical thing, priority in negotiations, presumably, that is awarded to someone or that the two contract parties would sort of uh, uh, claim for themselves and then put this under the authority of a federal league. If indeed an early document, this implies that as early as maybe the mid sixth century, a Boeotian federal state went as far as, remember what I said earlier about various developments in statehood and how fine tuned federalism might be, went as far as to govern rights of propraxia across all of Boeotia and identifying different city ethnics along the way. That would be a remarkable and in many ways a unique discovery at that early moment in time. Later on, ah, at that early moment in time, that would be very remarkable. So a study of the Boeotian League in its earliest conception and in its earliest phase has received all new impetus and all new excitement through this document. What else uh, do we know about Boeotia at the time? Epigraphic reference pertaining the Southern Boeotian Rim. Epigraphic evidence attests to, and this is more or less at, in, the, in, the, in the same timeline as what we've just learned about the Boeotian League from the early inscription, attests to the interaction between Tanagra on the northern banks of the Asopos River, you're already familiar with Tanaga, and other communities in that region. One of these dedications from Olympia that are mentioned here on the screen was made by the Tanagrans themselves. It's a life-size bronze shield uh, with gilosh patterns on its rim to commemorate victory in battle, open brackets, battle against other Boeotians, question mark, close brackets. While the other document is dedicated by an unknown Boeotian community to celebrate victory over Tanagra. It seems as if the tides go back and forth in the Asapos Valley and throughout the Parasopia. Indeed, this is uh, what Herodotus tells us. Herodotus tells us that in the final decades of the sixth century, uh, this, the people from the city of Plataea were, quote, hard pressed by the Thebans. Subsequently, they supplicate to the Athenians who uh, promised them support. Uh, the Thebans, however, are not satisfied by this situation, launch a campaign against the city of Plataea in order to force the city into the Boeotian League, or Herodotus, as he famously puts it, uh, to partake in the Boeotians, ace Boeotus Teleain. This has sparked scholarly controversies over a long period of time. Um, what does this actually participate Teleain in the Boeotian League? Well, the Boyotark inscription from the Heracleion that you've seen earlier tells you what it means. That's the organization. It's a real thing, and it's a real living body into which the Thebans sought to integrate the people from Tanagra. The people from Tana, uh, from Plataea, excuse me, the people from Plataea didn't want this. And uh, as it turns out, and as uh, we know from many other instances, war commences again in the southern Boeotian realm. Before battle is joined, the Corinthians appear to arbitrate between the two sides and to set a boundary. To set a boundary with the condition that the Thebans would not force such of the Boeotians to be Thebans as did not want to be such, end of quote. We don't know how they set up the boundary. 
We don't know how this boundary looked like, how it was demarcated, most likely by a border stone. We have other examples for this. What Herodotus found interesting is that this boundary was a line that separated those who wanted to be with the Thebans and those who didn't want to be with the Thebans. Well, despite the arbitration, the Thebans attack are, however, defeated. And another boundary is made in the same region. Beyond, quote, beyond the boundaries the Corinthians had made for Plataea, the Athenians set the Asopos as a boundary for Husii and Plataea against the Thebans. So according to Herodotus, with this arrangement, the Asopos River became a real border line demarcating the territories of the people north of the Azopos and those people who live south between the Azopos and the territory of Attica. Did this bring peace, lasting peace, or solve the issue? On the contrary, only a few years later, Herodotus tells us another conflict um, sparked and uh, once again in the same region to the left of the slide here, um, in the same region, um, the war parties of a few years earlier would uh, engage in conflict again and would engage in warfare again. Herodotus in book five tells us a story and he even has a dedication to quote that he had seen, so he claims on the Athenian Acropolis. The whole thing, Herodotus tells us, was a disaster, turned out poorly for the Thebans and those Boeotians who had supported them. And together with their Euboean allies, they were crushed by the Athenians. Athenians who set out to defend their territories that we've just learned all the way up to Eloi Terai. That's how Herodotus tells the story on the left-hand side of your screen. A crushing defeat, terrible planning, terrible execution on behalf of the Theban war party. A new Kioniskos from Thebes discovered in the early 2000s, published uh, in 2006, as the Editio Princeps from Thebes sheds exciting new light on exactly the same campaign. Only a few lines survive. But from these two lines, Vasily Aravantinos and others have concluded that the Kioniskos, the commemorative um, column that is inscribed and that refers to these events, offers a completely different perspective on what had happened. Note that the Kioniskos mentions communities that are not mentioned in uh, Herodotus. Uh, that's Oinoe and Phule, two sites that you've seen on the map earlier and that are not in Herodotus's narrative. Things must have been much more complicated than Herodotus makes us believe. Um, these people in Thebes who set up this document this monument, they went as far as Eloises to the Saronic Gulf, pushing south and for some time at least, making Eloises part of their alliance. They liberated some people in Shalkesh, from Shalkesh, and for all these wonderful deeds, they set up this Kionisos document. Scholarship went on and has gone through the pains of comparing these different strands. No matter what version we'd like to accept, we would always end up with the same sort of minimal consensus. We're dealing with an extremely muddled terrain in southern Boeotia, a treacherous terrain where no easy lines are to be drawn between 
Boeotia and Attica, for sure. We would already assume this. But between individual communities, their patterns of belonging, the way they would govern this type of belonging, almost impossible. Note how Herodotus continues with uh, his story uh, right after this uh, event by talking about Theban and Aeginetan uh, relations, Aegina in the Saronic Gulf, and thus directs our attention away from the Southern Boeotian Corridor and into the Saronic region that was at stake for the Thebans when they took Eloises on the borderline. Herodotus says nothing about this, but he shifts his narrative to what? The Saronic. In this sense, it's fair to assert that year after year, season after season, war in one way or another shook the southern Boeotian rim. The micro region was one of lively engagement, one of lively interaction, both peaceful and, as we learn from our sources, hostile. Along the way, it happens so that we know remarkably much about that realm and how that realm became a canvas for memory and meaning. Let me explain to you what I mean by this. Plataea and its surroundings in southern Boeotia are, well, you've already come to see this, uh, well-defined by natural landmarks, foothill and paths of the Kitiron and the Asopos River. But beyond those major landmarks, we know more about the micro topography and many of the small scale rivers and valleys. You've learned about the settlements. We talked about Thebes, Eritrea, scholars, etc., that were located in that realm and that were in close conversation with one another. But we also know about places of memory, again, places vested with communal meaning. Although more often than not, we know about their names only rather than their, act, than, than their exact location, let alone their uh, communal quotidian experience. One is the spring of Gargafia, which I think some scholars have identified. Another is a path called uh, the Three Heads or the Oaks Heads, depending on what tradition you follow. There was a sanctuary of Hera Plataea, a sanctuary of Eloicinian Demeter at Argiopion, which we don't know where it was, a grove of Demeter near Plataea, which we also don't know exactly where it was. I think I know where it is, but it's hard to make that case. And an island in front of Plataea, a little over a mile from the Sopos River. Note the rich pedigree of storytelling, of lived experiences and shared memories, memories that cluster in places such as these and that make the parasopia a living, a breathing thing. All of this comes to an abrupt end, to an abrupt story stop with the great war against Persia. You are all familiar with uh, the difficult situation in which Boeotia and the Boeotian League is in the early period of the Persian War, that is the second campaign for 80s. Um, and we all realize that this 
Theban perspective, that of medism and the working together with the Persian as the term, with the Mede as the term, implies that all this is a production by Herodotus in many ways, who steers our understanding, our analysis, our ways to interpret the material. All of this is utterly blurred by Herodotus, although often full of error, truffled with tropes, implausibilities, contradictions, it still is a great narrative that many people like to tell. So our challenge would be to argue against Herodotus and dismantle his narrative on the grounds of his own narrative. That's methodologically questionable, and complicated. Note the following, however, Herodotus paints this picture of diehard Medizers, Theban diehard Medizers. They are staunch supporters of the Persian case. So much so that they commit terrible crimes, according to Herodotus. When the battle at Plataea is over and some Megarians depart from the plain, Megara, just south toward the end of the southern Boeotian realm across Kitairon, the Thebans catch sight of them, charging them on horseback. They fall upon the defenseless. Um, they kill them all. Two chapters earlier, Herodotus leaves no doubt about the Theban motivations behind this atrocity and others, while most Hellenes who fought in the Persian camp did so in a lukewarm manner. The Thebans, quote, were keen to fight and not play the card. They wanted this. They wanted to demonstrate, their, according to Herodotus, their loyalties to Persia and thus committed the fiercest crimes. To what end, one might ask, and to what end and how so would relate such action to what we have learned about the Southern Boeotian realm in the decades leading up to the Persian War. We tend to look at the Persian War as this seminal event. In Boeotia, this is like anywhere else in Greek, it is part of, and in many ways interfering with, a long history of local and regional cooperation and violence, of course. Now, at this point, I would like to introduce two pieces of new evidence to you from the city of Thebes that shed exciting new light on these processes. The first is a document again found in rescue excavations and on display in the museum in Thebes today. The text itself has not been published, so we ought to exercise caution here. Um, it does have an SEG number and it is pre-published by Angelos Matayu in a volume edited by Nicolaus Papatsarkadas in the Epigraphy and History of Boeotia in 2014. It is a such part of our scholarly conversation. Matayu reports that the bronze itself contains several entries, with each entry mentioning an owner, a location, and a size and, and a respective size of landed properties. Several owners are recorded. We have several names of these owners, some of these owing multiple properties in scattered places. Here are the places, the Osopos, uh, a place called uh, Erginomos, uh, the Oyakron, the Upatos, and others. The document further on mentions a bola, Bule, obviously, the office of Patridioi, uh, Patidioi, um, Pro Rarchoi. I'm wondering if they relate in one way or another uh, to the earlier 
document of which a certain group is described as the epidamorpeda oligo, um, the group around the, an oligos. We don't know what the oligos is. Taken with caution because of its preliminary state of publication. The document reveals and teaches us that a Theban board would hand out, sell or lease, we don't know, landed property in place, places scattered as these across the ocean. Note also that the location of two further sites is unknown to us. So there ought to be six circles on the screen. We don't know where the other locations are. This one is interesting because it takes us right into the Parasopia. And according to the wording of the document, into lands on both sides of the Parasopia. So whatever the border management in that region was, at the moment of issuance of this document, a Theban body would see itself entitled to sell out, lease, rent, lands in precisely that region on both sides of the Asopos River. The legal issues behind this are yet to be determined. But we learn from the document that if the late sixth century is indeed the right date for this type, we learn that from that time on, the Boeotian League under Thebes as Aegis would again set in motion a whole apparatus of legal regulations that would govern the politics within the League, between members and across league borders, if at that time the Asopos indeed marked such a border. Note in particular that this territory, the furthest plot of land toward the west, near Livadia Lebadea, that that piece of land cannot possibly have belonged to Thebes at the time. It's far too far remote from the city of Thebes, which leaves us with the conclusion that an active land management, which would imply a land register in one way or another, was in place in Thebes to govern lands between cities and in the Chora of cities as remote as Lebadea. My final example comes from the same vitrine in the museum in Thebes. It's just one item down. Um, same fine spot, same state of publication, same venue of publication in Papa Tsarakadas. SEG lists the whole range in volume 60 between 505 and 507. This one is also about land. And this one records an arbitration over disputed lands. The opposing parties, reports Matayo, the opposing parties are the Megarians on the one hand and an enigmatic union of Thebes and Eloi Tarai. The how did we learn it? The Athenian border fortress of Eloi Tarai. That's how it figures in scholarship. A union between Eloi Tarai and, uh, and uh, Thebes on the one hand, and the Megarians on the other. Um, the contested territory was obviously somewhere between Eloi Tarai toward the south, toward Megara perhaps some pastures toward Agostenai, um, although we don't know 
the precise location at this point. Collaboration between Thebes and Eloi Terai would suggest that the document dates before the arrangement that we've learned about from Herodotus earlier that draws the Azopos River as the line between Theban spheres of influence and Attic spheres of influence. Once again, we don't know the circumstances. Once again, we are left to wonder how the arbitration was carried out and how successful it was. Bringing the Megarians into the picture, however, tells me that there must have been a quarrel between Thebans and Megarians at the time. Note how Herodotus mentioned that the Thebans were particularly mean to the Megarians on the battlegrounds of Plataea. Herodotus's motive is that the Theban people are bad people. They do this type of thing because they're bad. The bronze tells us that the relations between Megara and Thebes were heated and difficult in the two decades right before the Persian War. So that whatever happened on the battlefield in Plataea had a prehistory that is not known through Herodotus, a prehistory that we would like to know more of so vividly, so rigorously in many ways, and a history that is critical to how we conceive of and how we discuss issues such as border management within federal states, and in this case, beyond a federal state. With these observations, I offer you some brief conclusions, <clears throat> or better, I point to the conceptual challenges as I see them. Um, FIBO is at its beginning. It's not at its end. So it's not too late to raise issues of potential challenge and to identify moments of excitement that I believe will spark discussion as the project unfolds over the next few years. The first is the issue of diversity of place and the plurality of form. Given what we have learned today about the convoluted borderlands of Southern Boeotia, first off, the rich diversity in local place, each one charged with meaning and its own local history of violent and non-violent interactions with other is something that is extremely complicated to tackle. If we bear in mind that Thomas Heine Nielsen and Morgan, Morgan Hansen have counted a thousand and thirty-five city-states for us, we realize that the sheer number of state agents, the number of political creatures in a very small natural environment will make this a very rich research agenda, yet at the same time will also bring moments of digression and diversity to the fore, simply because those political organizations are not uniform. On the contrary, we're dealing with a plurality of forms, anything from small scale settlements with their own political uh, organization to a regional state, a federal state, and when Athens enters the picture, an imperial hegemony. Second, as we approach these types of sources and these types of constellations, our analytical framework, on the one hand, will necessarily gravitate toward governing categories. We would like to shape categories that allow us to rubricize our evidence 
put it together so that we can actually study and understand this. That's fine. Category shaping is part of the exercise, what we do. At the same time, we've also noted that our categories ought to be as malleable and as flexible as possible in order to allow for one diversity of place and plurality of form. So one of the main challenges will actually be to balance the issue of category shaping on the one hand and potential openness of categories to leave room for all sorts of historical constellations and contexts. That is an exciting exercise. The exercise extends into various and multiple nodes of regional connectivity. The Boeotian League is one wonderful example of regional cooperation and the regional working together, but regional connectivity has more sides to it and it works in a more convoluted manner in religion, economy, in politics, in other realms of action. To conceptualize this and to conceive of the interaction of, as you call this, intrafederal communities within that regional framework will be, I believe, one of the main challenges, i.e. you will return the team FIBO will return to the issue of the nature of a federal state and the idea of whether there's one such governing template or indeed more templates than one. Finally, the local turn, which figured so prominently in my presentation tonight, the local turn alerts us that as we move forward, a, feel, a full appreciation of local voices will be needed. We would need to hear, if at all possible, the voice of Demeter Eloisinia in Boeotia. We would need to explore those places of memory and meaning in the southern Boeotian countryside that we've come to know earlier this evening, and would, if possible, like to unravel their local polyphony of voices. More often than not, this will not be possible, but at the same time, we are alert to the fact that these things ought to be factored in and ought to be given due recognition. Effectively, I believe, all of this and bringing these challenges together, and I'm sure there will be many more as you move on, bringing these challenges together will lead to something that I'd like to call federalism 3.0. And federalism 3.0, as I see it, implies that there is federal, federalism 1.0 and 2.0. 1.0 is Jacob Larson. We, we've had the, the federal agenda came in full swing with Jacob Larson. That is, And the main innovation after Larson, beyond the sheer rise in quantity of evidence and scholarship and all that happened in terms of regional, the main push and the main trajectory toward the end of the last millennium was the ethnicity debate, right? regional identities and local identities and how they all come together and how federalism and ethnicity, um, ethnogenesis, the coming together of individual settlements in a federal set, they're joining in mythical agendas. All of this uh, was, I believe, the, the big topic in the 1990s and in, in, in the early 2000s. Um, that led to federalism 2.0, um, of which I myself, I, I made a small contribution to this as, as did so many others. Um, and when, when we had Federalism 2.0, the question was, what comes next? After 2015, the question was, what, what's the next step? How would federal studies continue? How can Greek federalism reach a new analytical level so that 
a new agenda can be unpacked. That's exactly what you're doing now. That's exactly what I believe many of us would want you to do and would love you to see, to achieve. And that is combining whatever we've had with the pressing questions of the day. Diversity of place and plurality of form, malleable category, an all new understanding of regional connectivity and the way it works, while at the same time, this type of regional connectivity is in close conversation with the local voice, i.e., lend full authority to local constellations, to local arrangements. Once you do this, your portfolio will multiply, but your body of evidence will also multiply. And in this sense, there will be a full array of local, regional, and trans-regional, intra- and inter-polis-federal border management. That's the full. Like, huh? that will probably mark the heart of FIBO's agenda in the years to come. And for that, I wish uh, the team in Trento, but effectively everybody else who works on that topic, I wish all of us in that sense, a fruitful execution of your wonderful research dossier. So thank you for your attention and the best of luck to FIBO. Danke, danke, vielen Dank, Hans, for this wonderful and challenging lecture. Um, I suggest we open now the floor to debate both uh, in the room and also online. As far as online is concerned, I suggest uh, just raise your hand uh, and then uh, switch on the camera, of course, and unmute you. You can ask your question live or otherwise you can also write your question in the chat. Thank you. We have a question in the room. Uh, grazie, Anna. We have the moving mic. Um, my question for you, Professor Beck, concerns uh, the degree of intentionality or political awareness uh, involved uh, in the process of ethnopoiesis. There are many examples in which uh, Greeks manipulated uh, mythology and history in, created, uh, in creating a shared identity, uh, ethnical identity, especially when a new federation rises uh, into the political scene or when uh, an already established one conquers a new territory, uh, which needs to be integrated into the new community. Examples of the two scenarios I mentioned could be in the sanctuary of Apollo Ptoyoso and the genealogy of the eponymous hero Locros descending from Hytolos. I would, I would like to know if these processes of ethnopoiesis are an expression of uh, an intentional political strategy and to what degree or if it is possible to say that they are the result of a fundamentally spontaneous process of reciprocal uh, influence. To phrase it uh, more clearly in causal terms, uh, does political manipulation of myths and uh, history in the Greek world uh, produce a shared identity between two previously different people? Or is the manipulation of myths and history the result of reciprocal influence due to day-to-day -day interaction, such as trading and uh, religious practices. Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful question. And, and thank you also for providing concrete evidence for this of what you have in mind when you talk about specific sanctuary sites and 
uh, specific uh, ethnic groups. Now, glancing at the at, at the screen online, and I obviously can see only a very few people up here in uh, on on our screen. I see specialists who work on the Arcadian League, on the Etolian League, who work on the B Ocean League, who have all, in many ways, encountered phenomena that you flesh out here. Uh, Jim Roy, Peter Fonke, Angela Ganta are but three on my screen, and that's there must be many more. Um, now, the term manipulation is complicated, as it seems to imply a certain degree of intentionality to tamper with something, which I wouldn't want to deny or confirm either way. Rather, I would like to turn you to the work of Hans Joachim Gerke, who has addressed precisely this issue and who has shaped the category of what he calls intentional history. Intentional history, uh, intentionale Geschichte. I don't know if Achim is in the, the online room or not. So Achim, forgive me if you are there and I'm misreferencing you. Um, but the concept picks up that very moment that you are asking about. The creative, shall I call it, creative rewriting, rearrangement of patterns of descent, of uh, patterns of belonging, of primordial beginnings in order to justify political unions of any given day. Angela Ganter has used this under the rubric of mythopoiesis and the rewriting of those various accounts. So rather than seeing this as a manipulative act, I would go with Gerke, and which is very, very often a good thing to do, actually, and place this type of argumentation into its context of a historical, or into the context of a historical culture that takes these things Hmm. not for granted, but that is adaptable to and that is open to this type of argumentation and reasoning. What appears as an act of propaganda or manipulation to us um, might have raised suspicions among the Greeks themselves, but that is not the first idea they would develop about this type of rewritings of history. Rather, they would see this as part of history's malleability, its adaptability to intentions and constellations in the present day. So while I appreciate your question, and I do believe that I, that I sense what is at stake here, I would urge us to step back and place this type of mechanism into a historical and commemorative culture that works differently than our culture does, which then frees you from verdicts and other assessments that are extrinsic in many ways and that are made from our history culture um, and allows you to delve into the history culture of the Greeks. It's a curious problem that you're describing, obviously. Thank you. Thank you for this answer. We have a question by maybe before we can give the floor to the students. Yes. Thank you, Pro Professor Beck. Uh, I'd like to know if the ethnical identity and the citizen's identity uh, are a peculiarity of the Boeotian or we could uh, make an argument uh, that the same principle uh, could be applied for uh, other contexts uh, as well. Thank you. Well, thank you. I, I'd say yes, that there, there, there's a relatively clear and firm answer to this. Um, when I talked about Biosha and one section of Biosha tonight, this has A, to do with my research portfolio, and B, with the idea that this really allows us to flesh out the problems and challenges and the themes addressed by FIBO. At the same time, federalism and mechanisms of ethnogenesis 
are such a vastly diverse and widely spread Greek phenomenon that they cover almost the entire Greek lands um, throughout central Greece and the Peloponnese into the Aegean and in many ways beyond. In this sense, Boeotia is not exceptional at all, but rather in sync with processes that we tend to trace in Arcadia or Etolia, to mention only two federal states that, uh, 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 that were already mentioned in our discussion with Focus, Locris, and others. In the Hellenistic period, this type of coming together and building a common narrative ground uh, reaches on all new dimensions with the dimension with the League of the Islanders, for instance. Huh? When the League of the Islanders is a first time naval federal project at sea, but it plays out and plays with similar mechanisms as the older federal states in the mainland did. So a very widespread um, phenomenon. When we did federalism in, in Greek antiquity, Peter Funke is on, 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 on screen here. When, when Peter Funke and I did federalism in, in Greek antiquity, I, I, I would need to count the chapters again as to how many federations we actually have in this volume. But we go over 15 to 17 federations that uh, each one distinct and adhering to its own logic that share in a joint federal culture, a rich field, which makes it very, very complicated for these feeble people. They have a lot of material. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you, Hans. There is a question by Giorgia Proietti. Thank you, Hans, for this wonderful lecture. You mentioned the passage by Herodotus, where it is said that the Corinthians, if I'm not wrong, were called as arbitrators between uh, two communities uh, who were at war, and that they set a boundary. I was curious to know uh, which is the Greek expression for set a boundary. And more generally, I was wondering um, if uh, boundaries and uh, uh, borders in uh, both the literary sources and uh, the epigraphic record were uh, referred to and conceptualized through a specific set, uh, maybe a specific and also a, a differentiated set of words. Did the Greeks uh, had, have a, a lexicon for yeah. boundaries and borders? Thank you. I just happened to read the passage in Herodotus uh, recently um, because I was curious in the language myself. And though, although I can't recall the precise wording, um, the verb is titimi, um, uh, to set the boundary, it, it's, it's, it, it's titimi, and, it, uh, and border is oros. So it's very gener generic. And in the same passage, he uses oros uh, uh, two or three times. There is no other word used in this. I myself was curious about this. There is no other word um, that demarcates what he has in mind, and he uses it to me as to set the thing, which is rather generic in terms of my philology of to me. Does this answer your question? It's it's not it's not specific. We would like to have something more technical or something. I, I, would, be curious. I would be curious to know if the Greeks themselves are differentiated somehow about uh, among different concepts of boundaries. Uh, but a border, a boundary can be many things. Um, but I will also look into the into the thing. Yeah. That Thank passage you. in particular has often escaped scholarship for, so the attraction of that, of that passage has escaped scholarship because it's, it's so curious. They draw a boundary which they don't accept. And for that boundary, it's spheres of influence. And this doesn't work. The Thebans would not like to comply. So they go to war and what they get is a real physical boundary because then it's the Asopos that is mentioned as the line, the division, a natural division line between the two. Um, and that too doesn't do it for the Thebans because if the tablet that I've shown to you at the end dates after this arrangement, they would continue to assign lands in that border regions and they would continue to penetrate that realm and would just not go by this arbitration. 
which is why they're all eager in 490, not 490, but then in 480, uh, to have their um, ways and goals finally achieved with Persian support. The Persians helped them to gain possession of the lands as far as Eloysis, which they had taken before. We've seen that. And the Persians would help them to secure a touchdown base at the Saronic. And the Persians would then go back to Persia again, which they always do. They always go back afterwards and leave the Thebans in charge. Then that would be perfect. It just didn't work out that way. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, che quindi noi non vediamo. Ok. Um, puoi leggere. Them. We have two questions in the chat and Claudio Beget is reading them. So, uh, the first one is from Ben Winnick. One of the mythic eponyms of Megara was Megareus of Onchestos, an ally of King Nisus. Do you think this suggests cooperation between Megara and Onchestos, possibly against Thebes? This is the question. Yeah. It's one of those instances where Onchestos becomes a melting pot for traditions, both Theban and geared toward Theban demands on the one hand, and the demands of others, non-Thebans within Boeotia and beyond. Both Orchomenos and <coughs> Megara lay mythical claims to the sanctuary site of Onchestos and the primordial story of, as later on it develops, of Boiotos' uh, birth and early history for the ethnos. A curious case, that is, of intertwinement of full amalgamation of various stories of belonging and descent. It's hard to tell what that Megarian example actually means, but we've just learned tonight that relations between Thebes and Megara were complicated. While I had told you this story from the perspective of Thebes and the Boeotian League, a Megarian perspective something that would explore Megarian moments, as it were, and Megarian aspects of these relations, would make completely different claims and would tell you a different story. And I believe one of these stories surfaces in that uh, story of primordial descent in, uh, in Onchestos. The question is always, from what perspective do we tell in the ancient Greek context now? From what perspective do we tell the story the Megarians would have told a profoundly different story? Thank you for that comment. Thank you for reading it out. Yeah. Another remark comes from Chiara Lasagni. I would like, I would just like to thank Hans Beck for this stimulating and challenging presentation. Mm -hmm. I am sincerely convinced that working on exceptions to rules on the local dimension on diversity is really the most effective and interesting way to keep the debate on federal stay alive and authentically productive of novelties. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for this comment. I saw you earlier on the screen, but you are not on our screen in the room at this point. Um, Thank you for picking up on this and, 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 and thank you for joining in and thinking along because this will be, I believe, this is my scholarly opinion, this will be the one fruitful path into the future of federal studies. Full appreciation 
of local diversity. The idea and the question of why to join a federal state to begin with, under what circumstances, toward what goals. Borders and the demarcation of territories has a lot to do with this question, obviously. But interests, claims, agrarian produce, strategy, whatnot. But each time we look at these things, they are subject to context, which will make it complicated in the future, I believe, to establish a grid of categories. I had mentioned this. On the other hand, I realized that we do need a grid of categories. So the balance between diversity and rubrics is something that uh, is, is, is truly challenging, but uh, I've, had, I've had the pleasure today, if I, can I just say this, do I have one more minute to, in, in my answer to say this? I've had the pleasure to talk to graduate students in this department earlier today. And I've had a wonderful conversation with people who are at different stages of their graduate career and who unpack fascinating, really exciting research agendas for themselves in conjunction with their supervisors. And what united all of these approaches and, and, and these different projects, different they were for sure, what brought them together, what united them was that each one of them was at the pulse of history writing today as we and how we do this. For federal studies, this I believe will be one of the, the key and one of the critical issues as we move along and the project, again, is only at its beginning. Who knows how many exciting new graduate students will actually join the team in one way or another, both in Trento and beyond in collaborations, who will work with you and who will all synergize to make this happen. Thank you, Hans. Any more questions here in the room or? Also online, I can't see the questions in the chat. But... Well, uh, I have a question. Um, Hans, you showed us a lot of cases of uh, intrafederal and extrafederal relation, which were sometimes violent, sometimes peaceful, sometimes cultural ties, sometimes religious ties, uh, a very various array of cases, which makes all this very exciting. Uh, so my question focuses on the very special case of Boyosha, you're an expert of federalism and also of uh, Boyosha. Um, would you say that there is a, a dynamic balance between uh, cooperation and competition between all these uh, political communities. And the second part of my question is, uh, if there is this balance, is this very balance which triggers this special kind of balance between federalism and hegemony we have in Boyosha? Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Um Greek history is, and Greek culture and the making of Greek culture mm -hmm. is full of those instances of dynamic tension between cooperation, competition, reconciliation, cooperation again, more competition, and so on. Uh, and an ever spinning wheel, as it were multiplied by a thousand to returning to Morgan's Hansen's number, multiplied by a thousand. It's this type of communal competition and interaction that I believe produces Greek culture, conveys Greek culture in the ways that we label and identify it. A vast array of modes and arenas of interaction. You were saying religion, economics, uh, cultural aesthetics. Um, in the Peloponnese, we know of neighboring communities who literally competed about artistic productions 
at a very, very small level in the terms of how um, how mason, how, how certain uh, stone cutters and how people who do masonry would actually cut female skirts into a the folds into a statue. Cultural competition between Sicyon and Corinth about skirt folds. It's a silly thing you might think, but it's something that really pushes artists forward. And that as they do this, and as they do this in an environment that operates with limited restrictions upon the artistic work, they create all new styles and means. Those new styles for third century BCE styles are the product of competition. That's nonviolent competition in many ways. And that example, I believe, is again indicative and so exemplary of how Greek interactions work. Inspiration through competition. This doesn't always imply uh, uh, battles and killing and violence. Uh, in the room and online are specialists who work on athletics and nonviolent competition uh, in ancient Greece and who are much better equipped to talk about this aspect than I would be. But that's another field that documents again the curious dynamics between cooperation and adherence to a cultural code on the one hand and competition within that code and under the aegis of that code, which effectively advances the code itself because everybody wants to do better. Oh shit. Is this specific to Biosha? No. Um, would I think that Biosha is a critical agent in this process? Yes. Would I think that in the early period, it is the most critical agent? Yes. But we're probably not going down that route of what's more important and what isn't more important. Um, bear in mind that the entire bulk of, almost the entire bulk of archaic Greek literature, almost, the archaic period, runs from Hesiod to Pindar, from Hesiod to Pindar. I know that there are other authors beyond this. Those are the bookends of the archaic period, to be oceans. Uh, thank you. To elaborate on this, we, our collaborator, Sebastian Scharf, is working on Athleten als Grenzgänger. There is one more question in who, maybe? Ah, certo, prego. Please, Alice Sollazzo. Thank you. Herodotus' description of the Battle of Plataea is uh, affected by at least two different traditions, the Theban and the Athenian. In your opinion, it is possible to identify a local tradition that is only Plataean, through the promotion of its shrines, such as that of Atinareia and that of Demeter Eleusinia, which is mentioned no less than five times in the histories. I didn't catch that last piece. Could you repeat that yes. again? Uh, in your opinion, is it possible to identify a local tradition that is only Platean through the promotion of its shrines, such as uh, that of okay, uh, Atinareia okay. and okay, no, okay. that of the Good. Thank you so much for repeating this. Now I got it. A Platean tradition that sounds so hazardous. But you know what? I, I just stick my head out here and I answer with yes. And I'll tell you why I do this. Um, in Thucydides, and knowing from the memorial culture on the battlefield that has been studied by so many in the room and others uh, outside, we know that Plataea has this, becomes this super place of memory. Huh? <clears throat> Continues into the fourth century where new shrines and new acts of commemorations are being carried out, et cetera, et cetera. Already right after, but Plataea becomes this super place. Now this is all pan-Hellenic, you might say although the sources make it clear that the city of Plataea looks after these shrines, celebrations, monuments, in addition to the pan-Greek games and festivals that are carried out. There is a local tradition and there is a 
pan-Greek, I'm hesitant to say pan-Hellenic, traditional sign. Note the following, however, that in Thucydides, when the Thebans and the Plataeans quarrel about, like in a narrative or argument, about the past, it is very clear that the Plataeans are stubborn because of that battle to which they made a small contribution, but which happened to be in their Chora. It happened to be carried out in their Quran. Reinforcing this type of commemoration after the event, magnifying it, celebrating this was something that was in the very interest of the city of Plataea, not because of its pan-Hellenic renown and fame, but because of its history of local and regional violence. For as long as you remembered Plataea, you would remember that the Thebans were the bad people. For as long as you do that in Plataea, you have a great narrative that shields your small community. So in many ways, this it, it, it becomes a Disneyland in the fourth century, in, in the commemorative the, the battlefield. You know? um, as much as this happens over the course of time, this really serves the interests of the people of Plataea vis-a-vis um, -vis Thebes, because it's a, it's a great type of memory making that stigmatizes those who bully them, the Thebans. Anything else Plutarch says about the local uh, games, there's a local festival, etc. So, but once again, it's interesting to put this great topic of, of pan-Greek commemorations of the Persian War and the Zeus Eleuterios and all that, put that into the local perspective and see how this works so well for the people of Plataea. It works so well because it fences them off from Thebes. So thank you for that comment, Tim. Vittorio, student. Uh, yes, very quick question. Uh, so um, as soon as you mentioned Tanagra before, I was thinking about Corinna, which, which was attested to be born there, and also to have written a poem about the, 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 the river, Hazapos. Yeah. And uh, so given that the, the process of uh, extrapolating, um, how can I say, historical, uh, historically relevant notions out of literature is always a slippery path. Do you think that anything interesting is, uh, can come from uh, such a poet for your research yeah, or yeah. not? Well, I've read Corinna, the fragments of Corinna back and forth and forth and back because they are so interesting. Um, the, in terms of local culture, the white armed women of Tanagra who figure so prominently in the story and who seem to be the label of the Tanagra figurines later on, but that's a different story. Um, the problem with this, uh, A, conceptually, yes, this is very rich in terms of fragments, as is, now yes, the problem, archaic Greek poetry. You know about the debate about Corinna, about what timeline Corinna belongs to. Is she archaic, is she Hellenistic? Uh, and there are renowned philologists in the room and online who know more about this debate uh, than I would do. But reading up on this debate and over everything there is on it over the past 20 years, um, the issue still seems to be inconclusive to me because the late dating, the Hellenistic dating, is based on an argumentum, argumentum esilentio, that she is not mentioned any earlier than that by other authors. If we take her as an archaic author, she's truly awesome. If we take her as an Hellenistic author, and here is my cheap way out, you might say, um, if we take her as an Hellenistic author and say, oh, she's full of local culture, which she didn't invent, but she basically collected and narrativized that goes back to the archaic period. And then the contents is again archaic, as it were. Um, it's authors such as Corinna that are critical to this type of approach. Baculides 
another author who writes about many sanctuary sites in central Greece with fantastic aperçus, texts often lost among historians, not philologists, among historians and others. So I would invite everyone to really delve into this body of texts because of its Pindar the same. Treacherous, complicated sometimes, but so full of local appreciation and aperçu. So rich, so rich that it's sometimes incomprehensible. But it's those types of texts that require our attention. All of you know this, of course, but still it's worth mentioning it because they are so rich for this type of agenda. Pinda also writes about the Asopos many. And on many, many occasions, it talks about. So thank you for bringing up the Korea question. I have a second question on this wonderful Mazi plane you showed us. Uh, um, given the material evidence, the material culture, what we have on the material culture, uh, can we say that it is possible to, to feel or to grasp uh, borders in this mm. area sure. in the material culture mm. do we have differences mm. in styles for example okay. now answering this question i would draw you to the work of uh, Sylvain fachard mm. and and his team and i'm and i'm not in a great position to sum up their research findings especially knowing that there is a monograph on the massy plane in the making and coming out shortly if I'm informed correctly. The published material, and I believe some of the PhD students and graduate students have read some of the materials that I had assigned, um, indicate the following beyond, and again, I'm referring hopefully correctly to the scholarship of others here. Um, the Masi Plain has three iconic sites today. Oinoe, the Masi Tower, which I've shown, and the Fortress of Eloiterai. Those are the three monumental sites. And scattered between where the team had conducted survey works, scattered in between is a whole bunch of ceramics and other things that they um, that they um, um, unearthed from in, and in various campaigns. The concluding remarks, in many ways, I read them as such, are inconclusive, as I had mentioned earlier. They do not indicate clear affiliation to one or the other. We know about uh, Athenian citizens being relocated and coming to that area and shaping engagement on the ground. We know about the Fule and the Dimi, I should say, excuse me, the Dimi in the Masi Plain, Oinoe. Of course, we know all this from the literary and the epigraphic record. But at the same time, and from the same literary record, we realized that the Boeotians had pushed as far as beyond the Masi Plain South. So again, I would like to characterize that region as one that is so typical of an in-between, a transitory and intermediary zone that despite firm claims staked by the Athenians and that the evidence is, is, is well known, despite those claims and despite the efforts in the 360s, 350s, 340s, it's the ocean again. So really these things go, these things go back and 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 forth, maybe with the preference to war, the leaning toward the Athenian cosmos. But that makes it so exciting. And I would encourage everyone when, when we think about these things, try, let's try to identify such inter intermediary zones. Another intermediary zone is the borderlands between Argos and Laconia which we have an exciting workshop coming up in, at, at Münster University in May, and of which you are a participant. Um, because that's, it's another of those intermediary zones, no major palace, no major palace, um, and um, an area of engagement that on our maps, we just draw the line and then color them. Totally meaningless. And I realize that you know that this is totally meaningless. But I think we should alert ourselves how meaningless it is and how counterintuitive it is to the body of evidence. 
What I appreciated a lot in the new Larsen, that is Funke 2015, at, is that you have a lot of maps without lines. There are just the names of the regions. And this is wonderful. I, I always show them in my lessons. Uh, well, thank you, Elena. And a, a deliberate decision back then, or a, a deliberate decision. But yet you might want to critique the cover, which uh, colors all those federal states and their region. In my defense, I would argue that when you look at those color and color schemes, you'll see there's always a, a white line in between, a white something that is not covered. It's those regions that we'd like, those uh, borderlands that, but I'm sort of pushing it too far, probably enjoying this too much. So, Razzale. oh, there is one more question by a PhD student, Luca Valle Salazar. Yes, uh, I will pick up uh, Vittorio's question from before about Corinna, which make, made me wonder, um, from my point of view, studying Athens and collective memories there and sudden tragedy, one thing that uh, struck me about it is that um, uh, I'm thinking about uh, Plutarch's uh, treatise on the glory of Athens and how poets themselves become uh, meaningful elements in the, in the identity of a uh, local tradition of a local community. Uh, because Plutarch says uh, tragedy and poets were part of Athenian, Athenian pride. And we can see also in the fifth century how this, how Aeschylus and Sophocles and Euripides were already considered, uh, their memory is already be beginning to pass through as uh, markers of local identity. I'm thinking about the frogs, for example, uh, Aristophanes' frogs, where these are already uh, characters who who are invested with a meaningful local uh, with with local meaning. So I was wondering, is it possible? It may be a, a silly question because of I mean uh, the kind of sources that we have, but is it possible to track some kind of local pride in the ocean contexts? Uh, thinking of uh, poetic. Uh, of uh, figures like uh, Corinna or Pindar or uh, uh, or even Hesiod, even if he wasn't biotic, but he was, he surely had connections, really well-known connections with the biotic uh, context. Is it possible to track uh, this, uh, the, the uses of these names of these uh, famous uh, poets in history? as markers of uh, local uh, local traditions, local pride, I, I may say, or generally local uh, feelings uh, in uh, the Boeotian context. Well, thank you for that question and, and, and comment. And you had mentioned the three giants already yourself. Um, speaking of uh, Hesiod, for instance, is... Uh, who is a, a critical figure in this process, as is Pinda, as is Corinna later on. They are being remembered, venerated by their communities in Askra, Thespiae, um, in Thebes for sure, and they become labels for the cultural productivity and cultural vibrance of place. Um, but if you allow me just, let's walk away from uh, Thebes and Boeotia for a little while to answer your question better. Um, Lazos of Hermione is a sixth century rock star who brings fame to his community in ways that his performance, his plays, and so his songs would be sung over centuries in Hermione. Um, and give order and meaning to cultural performances in place. One of his poems, and that was his particular technique, was he wrote asigmatic poetry, so he avoided the, the letter sigma. So I don't know how, what that means in, in, in terms of actual performances, but the asigmatic, and people would remember him and, and celebrate his songs. He becomes a local hero. 
at a later point in his life, he migrates to Athens um, because salaries are higher and the engagements are better and he turns his back to his native community, Hermione. But leaving that aside for a moment, he and others, countless others, are beautiful examples of a vibrant local culture that brings meaning to place. We know about playwrights in Fleus of all places, whose plays were performed for hundreds of years. They didn't play and stage Euripides or Aeschylus or Sophocles, they staged their local playwrights, as did Corinth, in which case we actually know that some performances from outside were for Bidden. So once you delve into this cosmos of local culture and the performance of local, locally encoded poetry, there is an endless field of figures, people who are identified with their hometown. And that is not even to begin and touch the debate about Homer and laying claim to fame by being his birthplace. Lazos is a real figure, he's a real composer. Um, and he's a great example for this. Beyond those giants, Hesiod and Pinna. They're, they're in a different league, obviously. Sure, thanks. And what is curious to me is that I, I seem to understand that this, this kind of local pride was connected to really local sites in the ocean, differently from, you know, Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, who were not from Athens, but then are mm -hmm. identified with Athens. Uh, I mean, it's kind of a different situation, but still, it's kind of curious to me. So I'm, I'm not sure if well, it's possible. Well, to... we need we need athletes crossing boundaries and artists crossing boundaries as part of this. And as we uh, as the project unfolds, as it were. Ischylos not being from Athens? I mean, they were from the Demoi. Uh, oh, not from the Astio. You don't mean the Astio, yeah. okay. <laughs> but thanks for your uh, answers. You're welcome. Thank you. So thank you. We are very late, but there is room for one last question. There is a question online. Uh, maybe Claudio can read it. Okay, you can see it now. Bye. It is a question by uh, Enzo Corti. If we talk about intermediary zones, which is for me a good idea, can we talk about um, frontiers that is culturally determined? That's complicated. Thank you for the question. And maybe ask this question again at the end of Fibo's research agenda, because it touches, and I'm not sneaking out here. What it implies is two things, if I understand the second part of the question correctly. Um, it implies that the idea of frontier, and it says is culturally determined, is on the one hand, something that is governed by the separation of cultural spheres, but on the other hand, the plain concept of a frontier is culturally determined, which is probably meant by here, and which takes us back to your question earlier, what's the word for this? And what's the semantic horizon behind this? What does it actually mean when we speak about those horoi in Greece? And uh, there, uh, practically speaking, Josh Ober in the 1980s has actually demonstrated how these frontier forts were by no means frontier forts. Uh, they were not designed to seal off a frontier, but rather move back and forth and then coordinate those various movements in both directions from those fortresses. Um, what Fabo will need to provide us with, if I may be so uh, bold as to make that claim, is a culturally encoded and culturally charged concept of frontiers within federal states, between federal states and other adjacent 
neighboring states. How do we conceive of cultures? Now, our oh, frontiers. Now, this question is not new in itself, obviously. There has been scholarship, rich scholarship in English, in Italian in particular. So there is a lot of material out there. But I believe that where we are at this point in scholarship and where we are with our ongoing uh, concept advancement in the realm of connectivity and localism, this will inspire the team, the entire research group here in Trento, and in many ways push and challenge the team to come up with such a culturally determined concept of borders and how we conceive of those borders. So I would take this as, a, as something that needs to be done in the future rather than having an answer for it in the present. It's a big challenge. Thank you very much to Hans Beck, to those who are here in the room and to those connected online for, for participating. And I suggest we will end here and meet again on May the 9th, I think. Yes, with Francesco Palermo, our next uh, webinar, the second one of the series. Many thanks again and join us to go federal. <laughs> thank you. Thank you online. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.